Well, good morning, everybody. Everybody good today? Yeah. They're going to try it again. They're going to make this TV work. Well, my name is Mike McGill. If we have not yet had the opportunity to meet, uh, I'm happy to be here with you guys. I'm one of the pastors here and filling in for Roy while he is gone, like Jimmy mentioned. And uh, it's so fun to be, uh, be up here and, you know, when Roy lets the kids take over for a couple weeks and all chaos happens, everything breaks down. And... But uh, so the last few weeks, we have been in this uh, fearless series uh, going through the book of John. Hey, good job, guys. Come on. <laughs> Going through the, the book of Joshua, and um, man, what a journey it is. The things that God wants to teach us and show us are, are absolutely incredible. And, and I'm telling you now, I got, I got a lot, so I need everybody to put their seatbelts on because we're going to go for a ride here. Uh, but it's going to be good. It's going to be good. So this, this idea of, of, of being fearless um, is taking our, our faith and putting it into motion, Right, Taking those things that we don't know how to do on our own, the ability to see what we cannot see, the ability to believe that it's there, the ability to believe that God can do those things that seem impossible in our lives, that's what having faith is. And being fearless and stepping forward in those things and trusting that God is going to guide us and journey with us. And maybe maybe it's in those moments where those things in our lives that seem impossible, and I'm talking about the, the real things. Maybe it's a marriage that's falling apart. Maybe it's our finances that are just a train wreck right now, or our career that's in the dumps. Maybe our kids are a wreck. In those moments where we're like, I, I, I don't see how God can, how, how this, where, this, where is this even going to go? I can't see it. It seems impossible that there can be any good that could come out of this. That's where God wants to lead you. That's where God wants to take you. So to catch you up sort of where we've been, uh, and maybe you're new to church, maybe this is your first time here, maybe, maybe you've never heard these stories before, but back, way, way, way back in the day, God came to a guy named Abraham and he made him a promise. He said, Abraham, I'm going to make you a promise. If you will journey with me, if you'll believe in me, if you'll allow me to be your God, I will walk with you and I will do life with you and I'm going to make you a promise. I'm going to make your descendants as many as the, the stars in the sky or as many as the grain of sands that are on a beach, countless will be your descendants and what I can do in your life. If you will allow me to be your God, I will walk with you. I will bless you. I will take care of you. And so these, these people, God's, God's chosen people, um, ended up falling into slavery under the Egyptians for 400 years. That's a long time. They knew nothing of what doing life on their own was like. And so God sends a man by the name of Moses. He says, Moses, it's time. I want my people to be free. I'm going to take them and I'm going to deliver them to their promised land, this land that I told them they would be going to. I'm going to keep my promise and I want you to guide them. So Moses goes to the Pharaoh and God does some crazy wondrous work. And the Pharaoh finally says, okay, go. And so Moses has now led these people, the Israelites, roughly 2.5 million people through the desert for 40 years. That's a long time. Moses has passed away just as they reach the border of where they're supposed to go. That border being the Jordan River that runs down through the land. Last week, if you were here, we talked about a a lady by the name of Rahab who was a prostitute. And God uses even the worst parts of her life to be uh, incredible acts of strength for you and I. The faith, the little sliver ounce of faith that Rahab, this prostitute, had uh, was enough to, to move mountains. And she ended up being one of the heroes of faith listed later in the Bible. That's where we're going to pick it up today because they're right on the border of this Jordan River, ready to cross over into this land. And they're looking at this town of of Jericho who has its its mighty fortress walls and they're freaking out a little bit. But before they can even get there, they've got this massive river that they have to cross. I mean, we're not just talking about a little stream. We're talking about the Jordan River, which was a huge, huge river. And at this time of the year where they were crossing, it was at its, its harvest season. So the banks are completely overflowed. They're looking at this thing and going, there is no way we can cross this. 
How are we supposed to go into this land, this promise that God wants to deliver to us? How can we even accept this thing if we can't even cross this river? And that's where we're going to pick it up. If you've got your Bibles, open up to uh, the book of Joshua. And we're going to start at Joshua chapter 3. Just before I read this, what had happened was, remember that, that prostitute Rahab, Joshua had sent a couple slaves over there to go scout out the land and check it out. And these two, these two spies, did I say slaves? S- not slaves, spies. One of those like, hold up. Spies, he sent two spies and they come back and they're like, the land is ours. These people over there, they have heard about us. They've heard about this massive 2.5 million people mass marching towards them. But more importantly than that, they've heard about the God that has been going before them and the crazy miracles that he's been, been performing. And they are paralyzed with fear. So right after the slave, the, they're not slaves. They were slaves. They're not slaves anymore. It's going to be all right. We're going to get there. Come on. After these spies return, let's pick it up at chapter 3, verse 2. It says this. It says, three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp, giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Stay about a half mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the Ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. Now, if you're new to church and some of this stuff is weird and you're like, what the heck is an Ark of a Covenant and what am, I even, what am I even hearing? When Moses was leading the people, God said, Moses, you, you're, you're, you, you people have never been under a, a, a way of life where you just do life on your own. You've been brought up as slaves. Everyone that came out of Egypt had been raised as slaves. They have no other way of knowing and doing life. So he says, I'm going to give you an order. I'm going to give you a system. I'm going to give you these rules, these laws to live by because they are good for you. They will bless you if you follow them. And so God gave Moses, in addition to the Ten Commandments, several other rules and regulations on how to do life because they, they, had, no, they had no clue. And so God gives this to them. And in this thing, this Ark of the Covenant that God had commanded them to build, they put in the Ten Commandments in there. And while they spent their time in the desert, this is where the presence of God dwelt for them. In fact, that Ark of the Covenant uh, was in this thing called the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was the place where they would offer their sacrifices to God. Their sacrifices were necessary because that is the cost of the sins that you and I make. The choice to go against God, to go do what we want to do, to rebel against him is to sin, and therefore sin, God has declared, it has a cost, and that cost is innocence. And God, in his graciousness for us, says, you know what, I'm going to spare you from that innocence being you. I will allow the innocence of an animal's blood to cover, temporarily cover your life, and I'll forgive you but it's something that you must do regularly until one day God in the flesh sends his son Jesus and he offers the final sacrifice necessary for you and I. And in his graciousness doesn't just temporarily cover our sins but completely removes them from our lives the minute we choose to believe in him. But this Ark of the Covenant is where the power and the presence of God existed for those Israelites then. So you can understand why he says there has to be a half a mile around this thing because the power of God is huge. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Notice in verse 3 it says, when you see the Levitical priests carrying this Ark, then you can move out from your positions and follow them. He doesn't say, go ahead and get yourselves ready. And when you feel like it, you can mosey on out to the river. No, no, no. He says, that ark, the presence of God, leads first. So when we're talking about this idea of being fearless and moving forward in our faith and how to journey that and what that looks like in our lives, you need to know this. You need to let God lead first. 
Let God go out before you. Understand that. Wrap that in your hearts. And he will plow the way for you in that thing that seems impossible to accomplish. Here's the million dollar question though. How do you know it's God? Because you and I, in our minds, what we like to do is go, well, um, there's this thing that I want in my life that would make me happy. And if God, who wants me to be happy, he's going to let me have this thing. Therefore, that must be God's plan. Got it. Nailed it. And God's like, "Mm, maybe not. Our experiences will be different, but in my life, this is what I've discovered. First and foremost, it's most likely going to push you outside your comfort zone. God's going to be like, this is where I want you to go. And you're like, I'm good. And he goes, nope, here we go. This is awkward and uncomfortable. I don't like it. But God's like, yes, I'm going to use it and I'm going to grow you and I'm going to stretch you because I know what you're capable of. I know the potential of what's inside you and I want to do it. I want to do this thing with you. I want you to be the best that you can possibly be. And so I'm going to push you outside your comfort zone a little bit. And the second is this. In those moments that we're being stretched and pushed past our, our comfort zone, You'll have this, at least in my life, this is what I've discovered, the, this, this uh, awkwardly but calming, soothing peace about the situation. In a situation that you should be filled with anxiety and all kinds of weird emotions and stressed out, there's this underlying current of peace that just kind of sits in your life and you're okay with what's happening. And it doesn't make any sense. That's the power of God moving in your life. I know for my wife and I, when we moved out here to, to Utah, we moved from San Diego um, we spent some time praying about it and thinking about it and considering it. And, you know, in my immediate family, I was one of the first of, of four siblings to, to move away from home, to, to branch out. And then, you know, we had all these sort of like nervous thoughts and it's kind of like, well, my, fa- my family's here, but we feel kind of this tug to go this direction. But, but God, you know, this is kind of where we belong, but we kind of want to be here. We feel this, this tug to go here. We prayed about it. We sought God after it. We spent time in his word about it and we got here and it just, everything felt so right. But through the whole situation, there was this sort of calming peace that just rested on our hearts. We just knew it was right. And that was the presence and power of God working in our lives. I mean, couldn't be happier. You're welcome. I'm just, I'm just kidding. You need to let God lead first. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 5. It says, Then Joshua told the people, Purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. Back then, before they would perform any, any type of, of, of ritual, of the, the, the sacrifices that they would make before God, they would go through this whole cleansing uh, routine. And that's what Joshua was saying. He's like, prepare yourselves. Get your, get your hearts ready because God's about to show up and do some crazy things. And if your heart's not ready, you're probably going to miss it. Get your heart ready for God to show up and move in your life. He wants to do some crazy things in your life. But if your heart is not ready, it may pass right on by. So when we're talking about moving in our faith, prepare yourself for God to move. Those of you who know me, I'm a, I'm a bit of a movie fiend. I love, I love watching movies. I love it. I, you know, I got the big stereo and just crank it up super loud and the high def and just, uh, I just love sitting and watching a movie. And, you know, my family and I will have movie nights all the time. But I'm one of the movie guys that uh, needs it to be quiet, right? No distractions, no talking, no interruptions. Uh, show of hands, who are my uh, focused movie watchers? Can't have any distractions. Where's my movie talkers? Um, well, that's my, oh. Don't even, don't, no, don't get me started. Get me riled up. Come on. My, in my house, we'll, you know, we'll make sure if we're having a, if we're having a, like a family movie night, 
I'll make sure the kids have got their, their popcorn and their candy and their drinks and everything's all ready. Has everyone gone to the bathroom? Because I'm not going to stop this movie 10 minutes in just to have a potty break. Come on, let's get, we got to focus here. My wife and I, we've been married for about 12 years now. And it's funny over the course of the few years, just learning the little details and ticks of each other and... Um, I swear she knows that I like to watch movies. <laughs> Inevitably, without fail, I'll get like 10 minutes into a movie and she, she's learned at this point, uh, she'll kind of like step in and like, I have a question. And I gotta make sure that she hears my loud, like audible sigh, like, <sighs> yes. I love you. <laughs> it's funny, though, because she'll start doing it. This is the same thing to me. Uh, so I, I'm going to admit a, a horrible habit of mine. I'm a nail biter. Where my nail biters at? Come on. And, and so we'll be watching a movie, and I'm just like chomping away. And she'll actually grab the remote and pause it and go, really? <laughs> but it's this idea of, of I, I don't... I, I like, the, I like not having any distractions because I want everybody to see what's going to happen. You know, the movie is so good and, and it's been edited and perfected to, to its perfection and I want everyone to see it. I don't want them to miss a thing because there's so much good stuff that's about to happen. And so I, I don't want any distractions. Just watch, just watch, watch what's about to happen. And that's what God is saying. If, you, if your heart is not prepared to see God move, you're going to miss him because you're distracted by everything else over here. God wants to move but he needs you to prepare your heart for him to move. Look down at verse eight. God is talking to Joshua and he says, give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. You know, I can't help but wonder. One of the questions I want you to ponder today is, is how, how many opportunities have passed by me because I wasn't prepared for what God wanted me to do? Sure, God's guiding my life and he's walking with me and we're doing life together, but I know there's been, there's been moments where my heart wasn't prepared or walking closely with God or ready for him to move and he's had opportunities just chomping at the bit waiting to give to me, but, it, but, but I, my heart wasn't ready so he's passed by and I can't help but wonder how many, how many opportunities of, of being able to fulfill you know, my life and have that, that peace and that calm about journeying with God the right direction, how many of those opportunities have I missed because my heart wasn't ready for him? And so then God tells him, I want you to go to this river. And it's interesting that he doesn't say, I want you to come to the river's edge and then stop. No, he says, I want you to step into the river and then stop. This, this raging river that's overflowing at its banks, I want you to step into it first and then stop. Whew. And that's God telling you and I, when you reach the unknown, step out into it. When you come to that thing in your life that you don't know how to handle, when you come to that issue in your life, maybe it's a, maybe it's a life-sucking addiction that you don't know how to get past, or maybe it's a problem with your children that are falling apart, your family is crumbling, your marriage is a wreck, your finances are even worse, you don't know how to do this thing. Every single one of us have those things that are in our life. What is that thing? And God's saying, when you come to this, when you come to this thing that seems impossible, I want you to step out first. Man, the faith those guys must have had, carrying the power and presence of God, not wanting to drop this thing. You want me to step? And they had to, they had to make that decision, that in a split-second decision, 
okay, we're, we're committing. We're not, we're not stopping. We're committing. We're committing. We're committing, and we're going to go. Hoping, praying, believing that God is going to show up. It's funny, if you spend any time reading the Bible and about Jesus and all the miracles he performed, there's one common phrase that he says to, to the most of the people that he healed. He would heal them and he would say, your, your faith has made you well. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has forgiven you. Your faith has done this thing. Because you could believe in this thing that you couldn't see or because you believe in this impossible thing that, that shouldn't be right or we can't seem to imagine how it could come to be, because you could believe in it, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has made you well. Not once does it say, you know, because you're a really good guy, I'm going to heal you. Because you go to church every week, I'm going to make you whole. Because you're really nice. Not once does it say that. It says your faith has made you well. And it's interesting because there's a few occasions where the opposite has happened. Where he has shown up and walked through towns and their lack of faith, he has chosen to leave. In fact, in, in the book of Matthew, he, he reaches the town of Nazareth, his hometown, where he grew up, and he goes into the synagogue or their, their church, and he's, and he's teaching. He's teaching with some fire, and he's like laying the, the truth down, and they're kind of like, who is this guy? This is, this is Jesus. This is the son of the, the carpenter of Joseph and Mary. Who, who, who is this guy? We know his sisters, and he's claiming, what, he's claiming to be God? Like, what, what's happening? And they were, they were ready to kill him at one point. And if you look at Matthew 13, 58, it says, and so he only did a few miracles because of their unbelief. The title of this series is Fearless. And it's for a reason. That in those moments we can figure out, those moments when our fear has its claws dug into us, when we're paralyzed with this idea of this thing that's in front of us that we, we don't know how to, how to get across. You know, we can kind of see maybe what's on the other side and we want to get there, but we don't know how to get there. We've got this barrier, this thing that's in front of us that makes it impossible to journey across. How do we get there? I would love to stand here and just say, well, just have faith and then everything will be all right. I can't make that promise. Not anywhere in the Bible does it say, if you have faith, then your life will be good, life will be happy, and you'll be full of peace. In fact, Jesus says, Jesus says quite the opposite. In fact, he says, if you follow me, you will experience trials. You will experience persecution. I mean, if there hasn't been a more controversial time to be a Christ follower or someone who claims to believe in God or a Christian, uh, it, it's, it's today. I mean, if you've spent any time reading the news or watching the, watching the news or in the media, I mean, it's everywhere. The attacks are out there. And if there's a time that's been worse, it's now. But Jesus said, in this world, you will experience trouble. But take heart, because I've overcome this world. So let me ask you this question. What's your Jordan River? What's that thing that's a barrier in your life between where you're at versus where God wants you to be? What's that thing that seems impossible to get across? Because God wants to journey through that with you. Take a look at verses 15 through 17. It says this. It says, It was the harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. 
And the water below that point flowed onto the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the, cha- near the town of Jericho. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. That, that town, Adam, that he mentions, from there to the Dead Sea, it's about 25 miles I mean, you think about this massive people group, 2.5 million people, and the, and the, the scripture said that they had to be at least a half a mile distance around the, the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of God is, crossing this, this riverbed on dry ground. Man, what a cool sight that must have been. And we know what God's telling us. He's saying that in that moment, when you choose to step out in faith, is the moment that God shows up. He's with you. He's guiding you. He's he's right alongside you. But that impossible thing that lays in front of you, it takes that moment of you stepping out in faith and then he's gonna show up and he's gonna rock your world. Here's the beauty of our God. He can do this because he's bigger than the river. He's bigger than your Jordan. He's bigger than than your failing marriage. He's bigger than your crippled finances. He's bigger than your kids that are falling apart. He's bigger than everything that you can face, and he's willing to stop this river for you if you're willing to step out first. Next week... uh, Next week, Pastor Jimmy is going to talk about what happens right after they cross because God is cool and just how he, uh, how he works in our lives. But if you skip over to chapter, uh, to chapter 4 and look at verses 15 through 18, it says this. The Lord had said to Joshua, command the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant to come up out of the riverbed. So Joshua gave the command, as soon as the priests carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came up out of the riverbed and their feet were on high ground, the water of the Jordan River returned and overflowed its banks as before. God commanded those priests to go in, to have faith, to trust that he was going to do what he's going to do. And he was with them the whole time. So when we're moving in our faith, you need to know this, that God will lead you in and he will lead you out. He was the first one in there to stop that water from flowing and he was the last one out after you've completely crossed this river. Here's the beauty of God. You'll notice that when you, if you spend any time reading the Bible, look at, even in fact, look back at verse 10. The first half of verse 10 says this. Today you will know that the living God is among you. And throughout the Bible, he's known as the Lord your God. Not the Lord the God or not the Lord a God, but the Lord your God. He is a personal, intimate, relational God who wants to walk through the riverbed with you. In fact, if God were saying this today, I I think he would say, I don't want to stop the river so you can cross it. I want to cross it together. Let's go on this journey together. I'm not just going to let you loose and go. I want to walk through this thing that seems impossible, this thing that is gripping you in fear, stopping you in your tracks. I want to walk through that with you because I love you. I want the best for you. You may not understand what that looks like. You don't have to. I just need you to trust me. To trust that I can use any situation in your life, whether it's a blessing or a train wreck, for your good. Last week when we were talking about Rahab, this prostitute, how God can use the worst parts of our lives to be the most strongest parts of our lives. That's the goodness of our God. That's the graciousness and the love of our God for you and I. See, the difference between where you are and where God wants you to be 
It's that one simple step. It's having the courage, being fearless enough to step out into that thing, to step into the unknown. And the minute you do, God's going to show up and do some crazy work in your life. There's an awesome app called YouVersion. It's a Bible app. Uh, I would encourage you to get it because it's great. And now, uh, in fact, I was, I was studying and preparing this morning, and um, I get a notification of the, the verse of the day. And I read it, and I was just kind of in shock and thanking God because that's how good he is. You know, a few minutes ago, we, we took communion, and Jesus was in the last moments with his disciples, trying to just give them everything he possibly could, every last minute little detail before he was to go and be crucified. And that's when he told him, he said, I'm going to break this bread, I'm going to pass this cup because I, I want you to remember what I'm doing for you. And it was in those moments that he shared these words, John chapter 14, verse 27. I don't have it on the screen, I just, I just want you to hear these words. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I'm going to give you, the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. Personally, I'd like God to give me a gift of like 10 million bucks, but <laughs> in my little tiny brain, that would make everything better. But God says, no, I'm going I'm I'm to give you something that you can't get out there. That all the stuff out there that would say is going to make you happy I'm going to give you something else. I'm going to give you a peace of mind and heart so that you can be fearless and not afraid of stepping into your Jordan. That's the graciousness of our God. Let's pray. God, we thank you that in the moments where we can't see where we're going, in the moments when we're staring at this impossible thing in front of us, not sure how to cross it, that you are there giving us the steps, showing us how to move. God, and I pray right now over every heart in this room that would begin to prepare our hearts for you to move in our lives, believing with confidence, with faith in this thing that we cannot see, that when we step out blindly, that you will lead us, you will guide us, you will not abandon us or forsake us, God, because you love us. Help us this week to be fearless, God, in whatever life situation we may be facing, not sure how to handle it or deal with it. God, give us the words to say. Maybe that's an unhealthy relationship that we need to sever. Maybe that's a difficult conversation that we need to have. Maybe it's the, the start of a journey on how to get past the life-sucking addiction that's holding us back. God, you know what our lives need. We pray that you would go before us, lead us, guide us through this Jordan River that we have to cross. And we step out in faith with confidence that you will lead us. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.